Welcome back to the Walton Supply Chain Center, focusing on on-shelf availability. My name is Mike Grain. We pick up and finish part two uh, of our discussion with Emil Martinez, who is the general manager of TCS Consulting, talking about all things retail as it affects 2024. Join us, and as we get started. Favorite quotes, I think, Emil, you came up with this. Maybe we came up with it together, but a number by itself is meaningless unless you compare mm -hmm. it to something. So somebody says, I'm 15% higher than I was. I'm 15% increase. What? I don't know if that's good or bad, right? So this compares a target, which is 95%, to how you're doing. Now, how in the world do you get these numbers? Because I just said you can't use your internal systems, which is how much do I have versus how much I'll sell. There's a couple different ways to do that. One is algorithms. Uh, and I'll cover these really briefly, Matt, because I think the purpose of the day is really to cover this in more detail. But I got an item that's selling 12, 16, 15, 15, 12, 11. And all of a sudden, it goes to zero or two items that go to zero. I can't tell you anything, but I can almost predict that product is no longer available on the sale. Okay. It's not on the shelf because you don't go from selling that many to zero uh, unless there's a, some kind of seasonality thing. So algorithms are a good way. And obviously you send retail coverage like an Acosta or a Crossmark or Advantage in to look at that. They go, yep, it didn't, it's not, it's not on the shelf anymore. I put it back on the shelf. And then you measure this thing, which is after they made that intervention, we are now measuring what's called recovered sales, which is I took an action. I got it back on the shelf. It took off again. Those algorithms can actually measure on shelf availability for you every single day. Secondly, is there's companies out there, this happens to be one called Field Agent, but there's going to be uh, companies out there that we will talk about here in a second that will do in-store audits. They will literally take customers, uh, shoppers, if you will, go in stores and collect information in store. That can help you to say, is it on the shelf or is it just in stock, which means probably it's in the back room. This is one of uh, the projects that Amo and I are working on. This is a Badger robot. This is a robot that literally goes in the store undocks and autonomously goes and scans the shelf. You see it turn the light on and it's basically scanning the shelf and telling you what's available, what's not available. What are the out of stocks? What are the in incorrect items? What are the pricing issues? So, so shelf scanning robots play a big role. Um, RFID clearly plays a big role. It, it literally allows you to count things extremely quickly and, and be able to tell you exactly what you have on the sales floor for a customer. Uh, other people use this. This happens to be an example from an online shopper uh, that this young lady is actually purchasing customers uh, products for a customer. If they find it, they scan the item. If they don't, they scan the label and go, no pick. I don't have the product. And the last one I want to share is, is fixed cameras. All right. So fixed cameras, shelf edge cameras that do that. So just to set up Matt, the, the day that we're going to have here today, we, we've got a bunch of people. We've got two companies uh, one is called BOPS and one is called Retail Insight that really have a specialized capability to do forecasting and to do algorithmic kinds of, of opportunities, especially if you have a high velocity items. These are items that you definitely need in your toolbox. For things that are more situational, uh, Trax Retail is going to be sharing later how their Trax system actually shows uh, the ability to be able to see what's in the shelf uh, using their Trax platform, which is an in-store data capture. Uh, we've actually got the top three, in my opinion, um, folks who are doing shelf scanning robots. Badger, Brain, and Simbe are all going to be on later on today uh, talking about their solution and being able to, to provide you updates on how their solution can work. We've got Williot and Barcoding uh, that are both you know experts in the uh, low frequency and high frequency RFID space. Uh, that definitely would be great contacts for you if you're interested more about RFID. Um at the date of this recording, uh, we do have SES and Magatag also going to be doing fixed cameras. Now, uh, just to be clear and be transparent, we're recording this in December. Some of the th the folks that we just put on the screen with with some of the providers may change or we may add some folks to it. Uh, so don't be surprised if that doesn't match up with the rest of the agenda. But for right now, Matt, these are the ones that we've got for the rest of the day. And uh, it's going to be exciting to have them be uh, part of this uh, conference. Yeah. Yeah, so excited to have so many of those uh, solution providers stepping up to sort of sort of share their story, talk about their capabilities. Emil, back to you. Give us a little bit more, uh, you know, insight into why 
product availability is so important right now in the retail industry from your own perspective? So from my perspective, and, you know, having been around the industry this long, if, you know, for those of you that have been in the industry or in the industry, you, know, you fall into this pattern. Everything becomes, you know, a new experience, an observation. You walk into a store, you shop online, you, know, you sort of gain this perspective. You're part industry participant and part, you know, consumer. Yeah, so you're sort of shaped by your experiences. But in my mind, it falls into three buckets. It's critically important to the shopping experience. So, you know, I, each of us, I think, as we embrace, you know, our purchase behavior, we have a consideration set for each of our areas. There's a set of retailers who, when we have a specific need, we look to one, two, three, maybe it's four or five at the at the max, you know, that we see as the predominant solution set for whatever that problem is or that opportunity is we're looking for. You know, so making sure that shopping experience is easy, clean, you know, capable is affected by whether the product is in stock and available. At the end of the day, the shopping experience a disappointment if I go to one of my key consideration sets and they don't have that product available for me. It's now complicated my experience. The second piece is perception. You know, if it happens enough times, I likely change my consideration set. You know, as Mike, you know, showed the slide that uh, that Doug uses that shows retailers over the course of time. You know, there's a reason that evolution occurred. And that occurred because over the course of time, shoppers' perception changed about who their consideration set was and where they were going to spend their dollars. You know, so in my mind, if you're not on shelf and available, you know, you are changing the perception of the shopper because I can no longer fulfill my needs simply and easily from that perspective. The second piece is, you know, it drives the future thought process. So if I'm a retailer and I want to be on that 2030 to 2040, you know, decade of who the top shoppers are, on shelf availability in my mind, whether that's physical or digital, you know, or the fusion of the two, which I, I obviously is where we are. Some some folks call it digital, you know, fusing the two words together. At the end of the day, the synchronization of that thought process is the difference maker, or at least one that's within your control to put you in a position to be on that list of retailers that are excelling, you know, in the next decade and the decade after that. The moment you lose that point of contact with the consumer, you lose start to lose the consumer. Doug referred to it as you're done. You know, let's let's take that done and and you know connote what that really means. What that really means is me as the consumer, you as the consumer, the shopper, stop going to that store to fulfill your needs and you go somewhere else to fulfill those needs. That's the death knell for any retailer, whether they're physical or digital. When the shopper now considers you irrelevant you're out of the game. On-shelf availability, the availability of product for purchase and for fulfillment or consumption is the game. It's that zero moment, moment of truth, whether you want to think of that from a marketing perspective or from a fulfillment perspective. At the end of the day, that zero moment of truth is the game. If you're in stock, you've now fulfilled an opportunity for a shopper. If you're out of stock, you've now disappointed them and made them go somewhere else. As we wrap up this conversation and invite folks to go and check out some of the capabilities presentations from some of the, the companies that you've mentioned that are partnering with us on the Solution Summit, Mike, offer us some closing thoughts, in particular, why you're so optimistic about the future with respect to on-shelf availability. Yes, it's something that the industry has been wrestling with for a very long time, but there is so much innovation right now, and it seems like there's a willingness on the part of retailers uh, to to invest in that innovation. So talk a little bit about uh, your optimism as you offer some closing thoughts. And, and then Amy, I'll ask you to do the same thing. Yeah, I, I think there's a couple of things, Matt. Um, the first thing is uh, there was a there was a perception a while back that brick and mortar is dead. We're never going to have brick and mortar. It's all going to be delivered in an Amazon truck. And, and it couldn't be farther from the truth, right? <laughs> Um, there will always be this combination of omni-channel, online retailer only plays like uh, Amazon today, but they're getting, <laughs> what's interesting is they're opening stores. So I think they understand that there's a correlation between some, the, the actual shopper doesn't want to wait for days for, or two days to show up in the door. Um, they want to be able to get what they want when they want it. So brick and mortar is not dead. It's clearly a very, very important uh, number two, we've mentioned a lot of things about on-shelf availability. Let's just be really clear. You still have to have the right items, the right assortment, 
it has to be priced correctly. It has to be able to, you know, as, as Walmart, you know, saving people money so they can live better. And they're actually adding the two, saving people time and money. That's the whole line, pick up and store and actually deliver it to your home, et cetera. You know, the retailers who are continuing to reinvent the way they can take care of their customers uh, are going to win in the long run. So from my perspective, that's huge. It's not the only, unshelf available is not the only factor by any stretch of the imagination, but it is an important one because if you consistently disappoint your customers after the third time to go after that printer cartridge in the store, then you don't have it, forget it. I'm buying it online and I'm not ever going to go back to that store to look for those things again. It is an absolutely important thing from my perspective. Number two, I think the other big piece of this is in a retailer like an apparel company, a Gap, uh, Adidas, 100% apparel kind of companies, you've got to really benefit here because technology like RFID can be a single sensor or a signal, sig signal that can tell you whether you're available or not available, et cetera. The challenging environments are the Walmarts and the Costcos and the Sam's Club because I've got some products that really lend themselves very nice to things like RFID, apparel and general merchandise and sporting goods. I've also got food products, lettuce and, and watermelons and, and canned vegetables, et cetera. So for those solution providers, those retailers, the challenge becomes, I got to have a multi-sensor solution. It's got to be computer vision, AI, RFID, 2D barcodes, a whole bunch of stuff working together to be able to answer the same question. It's more complicated for sure, uh, but it's really based upon the categories that, that you got. So uh, the last thing I'll tell you is we've done a lot of work, uh, already historical work. If you're interested, we've piqued your interest. Obviously, you're investing in the day to find out what the solution providers out there. Uh, go call, call them up, contact them. Uh, they all have some great solutions. Uh, it, you know, the, you'll have to figure out for yourself which one's the right one for your business model. But there's a lot of great content that's already out there on conversations on real retail and the U of A on shelf availability platform uh, on shelf of www.onshelfavailability.com. There's free resources out there. Uh, we definitely encourage you to take advantage of those tools. In addition to the virtual summit that you're having for today. Emil, any closing thoughts from you? So I don't know how I follow that. Mike uh, just traversed the universe there with that, uh, with his closing comments. But, you know, I, I think at the end of the day, you know, there, there's really three, you know, things that I would, you know, make folks stay mindful of. One is that data is at the center of all of this, that, you know, when, when you really think about assembling what Mike just described, you know, that intersection of many different technologies working together, you know, it becomes sort of a supply chain of data. You know, it's how you bring these data sources together to fuel common business practice, right? At the end of the day, you know, 30 years ago, I coined the phrase when I was in a, a prior life, you know, the data without action is overhead, right? At the end of the day, we're collecting all this information for a specific reason, because it enables us to do things more efficiently, you know, in a, in a more complete, you know, and correct fashion. So data is at the center of all of this. The second piece is, you know, as we think about the intersection of physical and digital and this sort of supply chain of data, you know, or sources of inflection points that that Mike described in, in his closing comments, you know, we need to think about how new technology becomes a piece of this puzzle. So things like AI, you know, enabling these things to be done in a, in a fused fashion. So this isn't about taking people out of the process. It's about making people better. Right. None of us, you know, if we went back a hundred years ago when they they you know they started enabling large physical equipment to dig holes, we're complaining that it was displacing people from digging the holes. We were celebrating the fact we could dig the holes faster. Right. It made the human condition better. So the fusion of AI and these technologies with what we do make us all better. So we need to, to work to combine those pieces of the puzzle. Yeah. And and the last piece of the puzzle to me is to to embrace the change. You know, at the end of the day, you know, the retailers who and the CPG firms who say to themselves, the consumer is shifting. I'm going to move without the ball to where they need me to be. You know, kind of to use a sports analogy, you move without the ball, you be in a position to score. Those who move without the ball to where the consumers are going to be and meet them where they're going, those are going to win, whether they're CPG firms or retailers. You know, so at the end of the day, it's leverage data. 
it's infuse the technology with the people. Yeah, we, we're never going to replace the art portion of this with full science. But we can augment it with the technology and the science. Yeah, and the third piece of the puzzle is, you know, embrace the change. Yeah, at, at the end of the day, you know, we've got no choice. We can complain about the change. We can lament about the change. Yeah, but at the end of the day, change is what makes us better. It's what makes progression, you know, in the industry happen. You know, many folks would have screamed and yelled about, you know, scanners before they were here. And unfortunately or fortunately, I'm old enough to remember when there weren't scanners in every single one of the stores. Who would not who would want to go to a grocery store today or to any retail store without scanners? Right? It makes us better. So all I would leave the audience with is when we think about on shelf availability, think about where we can go with this. Think about where the future of this value proposition is and what that opportunity offers you, whether you're a CPG firm or a supplier or whether you're a retailer or potentially someone servicing them like a, you know, a sales agency. At the end of the day, this change offers new opportunity, and I'd suggest that everyone should embrace it because it's coming whether we like it or not. Amo, Amo, just one more thing. Beautiful summary uh, of where we are. I'll tell you the one thing, and what's interesting, he just mentioned the scanner. Matt and you know, I've talked about this before. Um, the UPC, as we know it, just celebrated its 30th anniversary. Again, it, it was originally, I'm tired of pricing every single thing. I'll just put a UPC on it and scan it. It's actually celebrating its 30th year, and in 2027, there will be new capability that will eventually eliminate it. It will go by the wayside too, right? It's called the 2D barcode, uh, and you can think about that as kind of looks like a QR code. The ability to store other information other than the item number, the specific manufacturer item number, you can set, you can sort when was that product dated, when exactly was that product made available to the customer, uh, potentially serializing it. So you've got two TVs. You could say one is different than the other one. This one's available because it's on the shelf ready for a customer to pick up. This one that's hanging in the ceiling as a demo is not available. There's the same UPC, but you can distinguish available or not. The 2D barcode, look look up sun, Sunrise 2027 by GS1. Uh, it's a game changer because that's where the industry is going, and there's going to be a lot of potential use cases for in, for basically eliminating something that's been around for 30 years. It's going to get replaced, and it's going to get better, and it's going to take time to get there. But uh, these things will continue to evolve, and more and more data, to, to Amos' point, will be a key unlock for a lot of retailers. You know, Mike, I'm not sure if I'm off of mute at the moment. Um, uh, Matt, if you can hear me, take me off mute for a moment. You're not on mute. Off. You're not I'm on not mute. on mute. Okay. Sorry. I have a little mute button up there on the screen in front of me. Sorry about that. So the, uh, you know, one of the things that I, I think is interesting about your comment and about everything we've been talking about is there's a book of a million years ago that was published that I read when I was, uh, earlier in my career, I think it was called the discipline of market leaders. And the only quote I remember from it is that the company that doesn't plan for its own demise will experience it. And I think what we've been talking about here is planning for the industry in that similar fashion. You know, you, you, you're not planning for your demise. This isn't a negative thing. It's a taking advantage of growth and progression and opportunity. And your example of the barcode is a great example. It's not that anyone is disappointed in the barcode. It's that we can do better. There are new opportunities for us to embrace, and we need to embrace them. And you know, at the end of the day, we should plan for our own demise, but in a positive fashion. We're looking at a sunrise to these opportunities, not a sunset to the pieces we're leaving behind. We're building, you know, uh, Art Nielsen used to say that we all we we all stand on the shoulders of those who came before us. So the 2D barcode stands on the shoulders of the of the barcode that came before it and of the people who used to be the checkers in the old movies we watch and you know and so on and so forth and and at the end of the day we're all better off for it. Well, thank you for joining that conversation with Emil Martinez. I hope you got a lot out of the the uh, content of that material. Join us next time as we uh, welcome back to the podcast a good friend by the name of Myron Burke. Myron has spent his career in retail and technology. He is the current CEO of Divergent Technology, and we're going to be focusing our efforts on talking about all things, uh, which is uh, serialized item information. What is that, you ask? We're going to find out next time. Please come back and join us. Take care.